Thank you. So uh, our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Megan Dutney. Uh, Megan is a, is a associate professor of plant pathology at CRDC, and she will be talking about uh, diseases in citrus trees in the backyard. Can everybody see my slides all right? Can't see your slides. We can hear you, but I'm not seeing your slides. Hold on. Let's try again. How about now? Yes. Perfect. You're good to go. And I checked. All right. So I'm going to be talking today about identification and management of common diseases in the in the home landscape. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit like Dr. Diependrock's uh, presentation where it's a, a roundup of things um, because if you can't identify it, then you don't even know who to call um, for further advice. All right, so the first, first plot I'm going to talk about are the fungal diseases and uh, probably going to be the majority of my talk because um, despite the severity of our bacterial diseases and some of the others, Fungi are still the most frequently seen. So starting off with some of the, the fungi that can affect pretty much every type of citrus, um, looking at a disease called greasy spot, we get uh, these initial symptoms here are sort of a yellow model on uh, the uh, leaf surface. So you see like here uh, on this leaf here, that happens to be a Valencia um, leaf. You can see this yellow cast with brown in it. it looks quite concerning. Um, and then if you flipped over the leaf, you would see an orange blister on the other side of the leaf. Uh, fortunately, this yellow cast uh, will usually green back up and the leaf will survive. Uh, but if it is severe enough, the leaves will, will fall off. But eventually, uh, if the leaf survives and it uh, greens up, you can see what it looks like as it gets a little older. And here on the underside of the leaf, they become slightly raised. So if you touch them, they're quite smooth to the touch. Um, they're very dark. They do. It has the name greasy spot because it does kind of look like used mortar oil is being flecked all over the leaves, um, and uh, and then that, so that's what they look like on the leaves. And you can see that all these raised mature lesions. Uh, it's not hugely harmful to the tree at this stage. However, it can cause quite a bit of leaf drop if the infection becomes severe enough, which will weaken a tree. Uh, then we also see, and that's often the leaf symptoms are often what we see come in uh, through from homeowners. They're they're particularly the snowbirds. You know, they they planted their tree, they've gone off for the summer, and they've come back, and then their tree is just covered with greasy spot, and they're very much concerned. Um, rind blot, rind blotch uh, is usually mostly found on grapefruit. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see it on the other um, types of citrus. But uh, generally, it's most visible on grapefruit. You can see here, it gives you these great big large patches when you see it at the macro scale. Uh, this is a very bad infection. A lighter infection, it looks like a little dusting. Uh, this probably wouldn't concern the average homeowner. Uh, but what is actually happening is that these cells in between the oil glands are becoming infected. And uh, then they're slowly dying, uh, particularly around the stomates. Um, and, and as, as they accumulate, you can, as you can see these large patches. They start out as a light pink. This is a very quick phase, but then they become brown to blue-black, depending on the season, it seems. Uh, and it, as I mentioned, it's mostly a problem on grapefruit uh, and, and most of the cultivars, because of the usually orange cast of the skin, it's too light to really cause a severe blemish, except for in a um, severe situation, but it can cause the rind to remain green, and sometimes it can be mistaken for rust mite damage. Uh, looking at management, uh, usually we're concerned on homeowners to try and control the leaf symptoms. Uh, the, the fruit symptoms are perfectly edible, uh, will not harm the taste of the fruit at all. Uh, they're very merely cosmetic. Uh, we see this in the winter months, uh, but the infections actually are occurring in May to June, um, and your control measures should be done during those months. So late May and mid-June are the best timings for uh, a treatment if you're going to put one out. 
Uh, good coverage of the canopy, though, is necessary. Horticultural oils work well. Um, same ones as Dr. Diefenbrock was mentioning at 2 to 4% volume for oranges and mandarin leaves. Copper really works better for grapefruit in terms of leaves and for, um, for, for the fruit. But really, uh, what we should be trying to do, especially in a homeowner situation, is to uh, remove the inoculum, which is uh, in the leaf litter. So it occurs here in the leaf litter with the dead leaves on the, on the ground. Um, that's where we get the uh, fungus producing its spores, which are in this case a sexual spore. Those become forcibly ejected with rain, rainfall, uh, but then this particular fungus grows on the outside of the plants in what we call epiphytic growth, which just is meaning on the surface of the plant. Um, these then sort of do their thing over the summer. You don't really see anything. The microscopic um, threads are um, growing, and then eventually they'll affect through the stomates and leading to uh, the symptoms that we see uh, the earliest you would see them is November and December if it's quite warm, uh, but usually we'll see them into January, February, and that's when I start to get a lot of people knocking on the door asking about greasy spot. Uh, so we want to try and remove that leaf litter, rake and bag the leaf litter after February. That's when the majority of the leaves have probably dropped. Uh, cover them to compost or, and make sure that they're away from the trees or you could put them in your yard waste stream, whatever is most appropriate for your region. So that's what we're recommending for homeowner for uh, greasy spot management. Melanosis is another disease that can cause uh, damage on just about any type of citrus. The lesions are on the fruit, twigs, and leaves. So you can see here you've got uh, these raised lesions on leaves that become quite visible. They feel like sandpaper if you touch them. You can see it here on the twigs. Um, and then also uh, tear staining on, the, uh, on fruit, as well as individual tiny lesions on green fruit. Uh, on, uh, with most of these, you'll see yellow halo halos around the lesions at first, like you see on the edges of this uh, badly affected leaf. Uh, but those, again, like greasy spot, will green back up. You can get a fair amount of distortion in the leaves if it's particularly young when infected. Um, but fortunately, it does not tend to knock the, the uh, leaves off the tree, unlike greasy spot. Fruit lesions vary in size depending on age. So the younger the fruit is when it becomes infected, the larger the area is that it, uh, the larger the area is that is infected affected um, and they can coalesce, all those teeny tiny lesions can coalesce or join together to form large areas. And then if it's particularly bad after a freeze or something, we can get large enough lesions that uh, occur um, to either cause cracking in the lesions or even cracking fruit because the, the, the uh, fruit rind is no longer able to expand with the fruit growth. Um, but we also see tear staking, and that's from the spores being carried by the water droplets up, uh, up to the bottoms of the fruit. And then with the water tension or surface tension of the water, they then move to around the edges of the droplet. And as the droplet dries, they congregate there and, and infect. Um, so melanose is sort of a, an interesting disease. Uh, all of those spores, uh, that cause damage on the parts that we care about, the leaves and the fruit, don't actually um, uh, help the fungus move along to, in its life cycle, um, but they cause damage. They infect fairly quickly at 10 to 12 hours in relatively uh, moderate temperatures. In five to seven days, we start to see symptoms on the leaves and fruit. But really where the fungus is concerned, it's the uh, dead twigs that are particularly important. We get symptoms on twigs as well. Those twigs, when they die, uh, we get this formation of the spore forming structures and the cycle will continue the next spring. Now, interestingly enough, this fungus is also able to infect already dead twigs. So if they aren't already infested, they can become even after death. Uh, and then sometimes we'll see this ascospore phase uh, in, the, uh, in the groves on really old dead twigs, 
but this is sort of a minor phase in terms of disease management and it's sort of how the, the disease moves from older trees to younger trees, uh, not really by splash, which is how the, the spores usually move. So for management, we want to minimize our dead wood in the canopy. The inoculum, as I just mentioned, is produced in the twigs, the dark, the dead ones, uh, particularly uh, smaller than a half inch in diameter. So when you're looking at, uh, I know Fernando mentioned removing dead wood. Um, this is always an excellent advice uh, for one that's just unsightly, but also it is harboring uh, this fungus, but also another fungus that's much less common. Um, and then we recommend disposing of your dead wood with the yard waste again. Grapefruit is particularly susceptible to this disease, but again, the symptoms are not harming the fruit ed edibility, but it is but it can be quite unsightly, especially if you get that mud cake melanose where it becomes really, the surface becomes really scarred. For, for control, uh, horticultural oil has very little effect on this particular organism. Uh, copper applications are probably your best chemical control uh, and they should start in late April and continue to mid-July approximately every 21 days if you can manage it. Uh, and that's uh, based on how quickly the copper residue decays on the uh, fruit surface. And uh, uh, unfortunately, you're not likely to keep the uh, leaves clean with just that, uh, but we don't really worry about the symptoms on the leaves. Phytophthora root rot is another thing that we see uh, periodically in the homeowner se uh, setting. Um, we get canopy symptoms and pale green leaf leaves with yellow veins, looks a little bit sometimes like HLB damage. Uh, thinning canopies with twig dieback. Here you could see a tree uh, that uh, in a commercial grove here, uh, it's got, when we looked at it closely, it had phytophthora down here, but you can see this is the canopy. Uh, you know, it's really thinned out here, a very not thrifty tree. Trunk symptoms, so this is something we often will see in a homeowner setting in, a lar in a larger trees. You can see here we've got lesions in the crotch of the tree. Uh, cracked bark on the limbs from, from uh, Phytophthora. And then in a rare case, when we're in a dry phase, we can get gumming on the surface of the trunks and such. Um, we get fine cracks in firm bark. Uh, as I mentioned, copious gumming can ooze out, but it, in, uh, in our rainy climate often is washed away. So it's not a really good sign uh, for Florida, um, but it does remain in our dry months. And the lesions can extend down. Uh, if you get them in the sign, the lesions can extend down to a resistant root top, uh, rootstock. And this occurs particularly after flooding, or if for some reason somebody has decided to try and put a tree back up straight after something like a tropical storm. Um, and then you'll find that the trunk becomes uh, completely riddled with phytophthora on occasion. So root rot, uh, looking at what we see on the lower trunks, here you can see that this, this tree here has significant phytophthora lesions on the bottom. It's trying to heal itself over, but it's likely to die. Uh, they'll circle the trunk slowly, so it'll continue to progress around the rest of this trunk. Um, I forgot I didn't have my pointer on, I'm sorry. So you can see it'll circle around the trunk uh, and happen more rapidly in nursery trees. Uh, as I mentioned, it's more large in uh, larger, more rare in large trees. Here's some scars here from Phytophthora, um, where the callus has started to grow around around these lesions, um, and it gives raised margins and it, and it helps the air, the bark pop off. Um, when we get root symptoms, we often have susceptible rootstocks. Uh, the lesions can occur on structural roots, and that means that that tree is probably not going to be resurrected and canopy symptoms can become apparent before we see trunk symptoms. Um, so looking at root rot, what does it actually look like? Uh, so this is uh, from, from work in a greenhouse, but it gives you a flavor of what's happening underground. Here's some healthy citrus roots. This is what they should look like. This is what they look like after a severe phytophthora infection. You can see that there's just not as many roots, but also they're shedding their um, outer cortex to leave you the, the steel. Um, and we get general discoloration of, of, the, of the roots. Uh, in field trees, we see loss of fibrous roots and it can be significant, can cause the death of, of small trees. So here you can see, this is one where 
you can see it obviously had a sudden failure. We tipped the tree over to see what was happening underground because we couldn't see any other symptoms. We noticed that there were no fibrous roots left on this tree. It was really just the structural roots. And even here on this canopy, you can see some fibrous root or this root system, you can see some fibrous roots, but you don't see very many, uh, as many as there should be. Uh, cause the death of smaller trees, but it's, that's pretty rare in mature trees, but it does reduce the fruit size and the leaf yield. You get leaf loss and a lot of twig dieback, and generally the tree will look very unthrifty. Looking at management, this one's a tough one to manage in the home uh, landscape. There are two organisms that are involved here in Florida. There are others elsewhere. Um, Phytophthora nicotiani is the most common um, one that you will see in the home landscape, occasionally palmivora, um, but not so frequently. Irrigation management will be very important because susceptibility of the roots are highest when we go from very wet to very dry cycles. Um, it causes the uh, roots to exude more and that attracts the spores called zoospores. So zoospores are these little guys that are motile. They swim towards uh, either fruit on the ground or roots. And then, uh, but then also HOB we found has also causes those roots to exude more and promotes infection. So that can be a problem. The best management for this disease really is avoidance in the home landscape. So making sure that your trees don't have a root rot problem before you plant them. Um, most nurseries are, are supposed to be uh, managing this. So it shouldn't be coming out of the nurseries, but always need to be careful. Um, and no climbing into the tree canopy for whatever purpose, whether it's uh, pruning or what have you. Um, avoid flooding if possible. Um, I know Lauren mentioned wetting down the canopy. Uh, that's often not great for diseases. Uh, as long as it's brief, I suppose that should be okay. Um, but uh, frequent wetting of a, of, of a trunk or canopy is not great, especially if there's a lot of splash. So what we get, uh, we get the zoospores, they move into the root system. Um, we get them, they can climb into the canopy, causing a disease called brown rot, not so common in the uh, homeowner situation. Uh, but those infected roots then allow um, this fungus or this fungus like organisms, which are not actually fungi, um, to then propagate, produce resting spores. Those resting spores are then even straight out of the roots, can form these zoospores. And as long as you've got uh, roots functioning, this organism, uh, particularly around flushes, can infect. And I uh, was looking to see if there were any chemical products that were available to control phytophthora for the homeowners. And I was unable to find any evidence that something like a phosphate salt was available in a homeowner situation. So I'm loath to recommend any chemical management for this in the homeowners until I can find that there's a legal source. Alternary brown spot is something we see on mandarins. Um, leaf symptoms can be fairly devastating. Um, they cause tremendous thinning of, this, of the canopy. On older lesions, we get uh, large necrotic uh, lesions. They have dark middles like you can see here and here. Um, and uh, they have dark margins as well. They have a little bit of an angular shape more than you would expect in a normal uh, fungal lesion or a regular, more common, I should say, fungal lesion. Uh, they follow the veins with these dark streaks. So you can see vein necrosis uh, there, vein necrosis there, and some vein necrosis on this one. Um, you can also get cracking in the leaf tissue uh, and then flecking on the newer lesions. Um, and they they tend to be uh, small and tan brown lesions. Uh, sometimes they have prominent halos. This happens to be a fairly chlorotic leaf, but you can see some of the halos here on these younger lesions. We get twig symptoms as well, which is what leads to some of the, the canopy thinning um, because it'll kill the twigs and those can be long bladed brown, uh, but they tend not to have the big halos. Um, on the fruit can be fairly showy. Um, we get older lesions, but they're easily mistaken for things like canker. So older lesions can be single like this one or in large clusters. Uh, they have that tan color that form a sort of a really quirky protrusion and are quite rough. These can be quite challenging to differentiate from canker um, 
even even I sometimes have trouble depending on the situation. Uh, but the one thing that happens that doesn't happen with canker with happens with brown spot is that they'll fall out and leave these tan scars. So you can see one here has fallen out, leaving scarring. Uh, here's some other scars plus ones that haven't fallen out yet. Um, and it, if the fruit is older, when an infection happens, you get this pin pricking sort of pattern. So you can see that here on this fruit. Um, and on the young lesions, we will, I don't, on, on young lesions here, like this one on a miniola, you can see that it's got uh, yellow halos. And they look like dark brown to black pits. And it isn't till later that they start forming these corky protrusions. As I mentioned before, this only occurs on tangerines and tangerine hybrids. Looking at man management, um, you want to try and increase the air movement around the canopy. Uh, try not to overwater or over fertilize. Um, no overhead watering on your mandarins if you've got a problem with brown spot. Um, uh, you'll have to find some other way to manage those mites. Uh, remove the leaf litter in the spring, kind of cover cover them or compost with, uh, with compost or dispose with your yard waste stream again, prune out your dead twigs. Um, and then chemical control option is copper. The applications start really early in the season as that flush, new flush expands, trying to keep it clean so that they're not, it's not infecting your fruit. Um, and they would continue every 21 days until June. This is a pretty rigorous um, control uh, prospect for most homeowners, but uh, it can be done in the homeowner situation. Um, and uh, it's caused by a fungal disease, uh, fungal uh, organism, it's Alternaria alternata. And the Canidae are coming in on the dead tissues in the canopy floor. Um, they become airborne, uh, but they're also forming on some of the older lesions in your canopy. They uh, infect young leaves, fruit, and stems. You get infection. Fortunately, we don't see spores until about a month or so after they infect, uh, but the symptoms are present. And then this cycle will continue as long as there's available flush and, um, and, uh, and, and rainfall. And uh, uh, you know, just as an example, I was out visiting a grove not that long ago where we saw active symptoms on new flush that had occurred. Uh, because we've had rain recently, that flush had become infected. So it can happen any time of year. But in terms of fruit, keeping the fruit protected, um, it will, uh, it, the, up from the springtime would be your most important time. And uh, the fruit we should taste okay, provided they don't fall off. This disease will cause uh, fruit to drop. Citrus scab is another highly unsightly disease that we see on, on mandarins. Um, the lesions are a mix of fungal and plant tissues. Uh, the fruit lesions are slightly raised and pink to light brown. Um, so they start, this is an early, uh, early fruit lesions. You can see they've got this really interesting pink color to them. Um, on some varieties like temple or satsuma mandarin, they can really become raised, but they are more flatter. They're, uh, they are flatter on things like grapefruit. They look more like uh, wind scar. They're warty and cracked, quite unsightly, make people really worried, can be mistaken easily for canker. Um, but the color changes over time from yellow to brown, then oak, and finally to sort of a gray color. Uh, the leaf lesions form these divots on one side, but then they have a protrusion on the other. The fungus is really at that tip. So you can see here, there's the fungus, there's the fungus, and then it's, if you turn it over, there's a divot on the other side. Uh, they're raised in nature. Um, and if it's affected younger, then it becomes more raised. Management is relatively simple. Uh, we're really concerned about uh, these lesions that are on last year's fruit and leaves. Um, there's a splash dispersed spore, so it doesn't go very far, but it often will come in on nursery stock. Um, and then there's an airborne spore that doesn't go very far either. You get uh, tender fruit and leaves. They're infecting with five to six hours of wetting at 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Symptoms occur in five, six to seven days. However, this thing can infect really, really quickly if it's given the right conditions. Um, doesn't affect the edible quality of the fruit again, but it's very unsightly. People get very worried. Um, 
but you can prune it out uh, if you've got a bad case of it, I would recommend sort of just pruning out as much as you can and then doing that for a few years. Um, that's, you know, it's a form of inoculum reduction. If you were trying to control it with chemicals, um, the only thing you've got available is copper. Copper is not particularly, <clears throat> copper is not particularly effective for this disease, but timing is also very critical. So your first application would go out in, at your spring flush when it was half expanded. So you got to really keep an eye on what those uh, leaves are doing. Then the second application would be at petal fall, and then the third application at two weeks post petal fall. The most important applications would be the second and the third one. Uh, you could skip the first one, but if you're using copper, you probably want to be able to do all three uh, if you had any hope of really being effective. If you're replanting, ensuring that the disease isn't the tree isn't diseased prior to planting is pretty important. Making sure you haven't got too vigorous a rootstock is also helpful. Um, you know, alternary brown spot and citrus scab should not be um, on nursery trees, but occasionally you do see stuff coming from the nurseries with those two diseases. And so I always recommend, whether it's for commercial purposes or a homeowner, to really look at the tree and if it's got that, just walk away and see if you can find a better source. So looking at bacterial diseases, really only two major ones here in Florida. Citrus canker is probably the one that people see most visually. Uh, the leaf lesions are visible on both sides of the leaves. You have initial lesions that are pinpoint spots. Um, so like these ones here, these are the really young lesions. So you can see some up here too, quite difficult to see very early on. Uh, they're less than 10 millimeters. They're slightly raised, blister-like. Um, then they move to circular or irregular in shape. They become corky, uh, raised on both sides of the leaf. So that would be one of the ways you would tell the difference between that and citrus scab. Uh, citrus scab would be raised only on one side of the leaf. Uh, often you see a prominent yellow halo like you do here or these leaves here. Uh, and then the center becomes necrotic as the leaves age. Often you'll see a brown margin around the edge. Um, these ones are a little bit younger. Uh, as the lesions age, they turn tan. Then they eventually they become dark brown to gray as other organisms colonize the lesions. Um, and the margins become brown. Here's an example of uh, what citrus canker looks like in a leaf mine. Here, uh, I know that Dr. Diefenbrock mentioned leaf miner and canker. So that's an example of how leaf miner can make canker much worse than it would be. Each of you know, there might have been one or two lesions on this leaf, but with the leaf mine uh, leaving an open wound, uh, canker is able to infest that whole area uh, without much difficulty and um, really amplify the amount of bacteria that would be formed. Uh, on the fruit, the lesions are gray to brown, uh, and black, they've become black and raised. Uh, so here you can see these sort of blackened and raised uh, as, and if they get really old, they uh, will sink a little bit uh, as the rest of the fruit expands around them, get this green halo where the fruit doesn't ripen properly and a dark brown sort of margin as the, as the plant has walled it off. Um, you often get water soaked margins around the edge. So here's the water soaking, uh, that could be quite, quite bad. And um, the fruit as much can be remain green. Uh, They'll often get early fruit drop. Yeah, those are from uh, lesions that occur sort of here up around the uh, calyx near that abscission zone. And uh, then the, the fruit will drop. Uh, you could eat these fruit uh, with a canker lesion on it. I don't think it's gonna really affect the taste, um, but you don't then wanna go out and play with your, your citrus tree afterwards. Um, lesion, uh, then you also get uh, stem lesions. These are probably the hardest to find on a tree, but these are probably the long-term inoculum sources in a localized area. They usually indicate the bacteria has been present in a tree for a long time, but they're quite difficult to see. Uh, they, they can be very, very subtle. Uh, and then especially as the wood gets older, they can last for up to four years and, and uh, ooze bacteria for that whole time. So mentioned this is a bacterial disease, Xanthomonas citri, subspecies citri is the causal agent. Uh, the stem lesions uh, are where it sort of starts with the uh, being picked up by the wind and rain. 
that gets forced into the tissues of the tree when they're susceptible, uh, when they're about half mature, usually the susceptibility really picks up. They get, you get lesions uh, from that, but they can also go in through wounds. You can spread it by pruning um, and infections can form. Then you get the, the infections forming. And even before you can see the lesions particularly easily, you get bacteria oozing back out and then the wind and rain will pick it back up. So this is why this disease can be so devastating here in Florida. Obviously you're not gonna eat a fruit that looks like that. I wouldn't eat that either. Uh, you know, where it's oozing all kinds of bacteria, bacteria and sap and a slurry. Um, but, you know, more minor lesions are, are not going to hurt anybody. Um, all types of fruit are susceptible, but oranges and grapefruit, early oranges, I should say, and grapefruit are the most susceptible. Um, and when the, those lesions are moist, the bacteria ooze out, they spread to the new trees. Windblown rain is probably the main means of uh, dispersal. Uh, and wind speeds of greater than 18 miles per hour uh, force bacteria through the stomates or wounds. Um, however, we're pretty good agents of spread. It doesn't need uh, just the wind and rain. Um, we can move it uh, on infected or exposed trees, seedlings, and propagative materials. Uh, we know this is how it traveled longer distances, uh, like from central Florida to the panhandle. Um, Contaminated coal, clothing, tools, landscaping equipment, ladders, uh, containers are all potential sources of infection because you can just pick it up on your body or on your clothes and move it just by brushing. Uh, and then it just makes its way in eventually. Uh, you, so you need to be decontaminating any lawn tools, especially if you're sharing with others. Um, an effective decontamination uh, solution is easily found. Uh, one ounce of household bleach to a gallon of water is pretty pretty effective. However, it can't be made and then let sit. Um, and also, if you're you've got a lot of visible filth on your equipment, bleach is not going to be effective. It's just going to get used up on the visible filth and not really get to the bacteria. Uh, so you need to sort of have somewhat clean, uh, or at least scrape off the visible filth and then disinfest. Uh, 70% uh, alcohol will also be uh, helpful uh, if that's a preferable solution. Um, copper products are effective in suppressing fruit infections, but they don't really stop the leaf infections because they leaves stay susceptible for so long and they grow quickly. Um, and also it has very limited value in reducing disease spread. But if you wish to use it, you would start every three weeks between mid-May to mid-July for most uh, citrus, if you really wanted to keep your grapefruit clean, you would have to continue on to October, but for most homeowners, I would never recommend that. Uh, so if you have citrus canker, um, you don't want to transport stuff around. Um, if you're taking it anywhere, you know, if you want to take it into a county extension office to confirm that that is what somebody had, uh, you'd want to double bag it. Washing your hands with soap and water after handling samples is always uh, essential. Um, pruning away the infected area and uh, double bagging it and disposing it in your lawn waste or burning it, uh, depending on, of course, local regulations. And then if you want to plant a new tree, you know, for whatever reason your tree has failed, um, I would, and you forgot canker in the area, I would recommend putting it in a wind sheltered area, like where two parts of a fence, for example, might meet. Um, as I mentioned before, the fruit are safe to eat, but they're very unsightly. Bacterium is not harmful to humans. It's only harmful to plants, in particular citrus, um, but it does cause a lot of fruit drop. The other major bacterial disease, of course, is one we've been talking about a lot, HLB. So I'm just gonna go over the symptoms uh, uh, primarily, uh, just so everybody's on the same page. Uh, so blood, you know, what we see, we look for is this blotchy model pattern. You know, it's asymmetrical across that mid vein. Um, here's another example, uh, looking at, you know, if you wanted to quickly just do an eye test, you would put two circles on either side of, of the mid vein and look to see if the pattern's the same. If it is the same, then you're probably looking at something like a nutrient deficiency. You can see here the pattern is the same. If it's not, uh, then you want to investigate to see if uh, HLB is a problem. Um, you can get vein corking here. You can see this is where showing signs of phloem. Uh, the phloem is not working properly. It's 
probably blocked. The plant is trying to compensate by producing more um, vascular tissue. You see color inversion, aborted seeds inside, yellow veins underneath the, when you cut it over and underneath the calyx. Um, and then sometimes this can be quite distorted or, or, or bent, uh, depending on how you cut the fruit. Tree symptoms, I'm looking at a whole tree. Uh, you can see here we've got um, some, some uh, sex, a sectoring within the canopy, and one whole branch that's really yellow. That's indicative of something like HLB. In fact, that is partly where the name comes from, yellow shoot disease. Um, uh, leaf and yellow, uh, you get leaf and fruit drops this year. You can see these very unthrifty trees. This one, in fact, has died finally, um, where you get a lot of uh, twig, twig dieback. Uh, the tree just doesn't look right. It's got very few, very little foliage. It's very upright. Uh, it's sparse, tons of twig dieback. And then uh, you often will see some off season bloom. So bloom in the middle of summer or in the middle of winter when it shouldn't be blooming. Um, you really want to know whether it's HLB or not, you want to test, um, you could contact the Division of Plant Industry in Gainesville or the Plant Disease Clinic, both in Gainesville. They will run a PCR test for Liberbacter um, Asiaticus, which is that cause of bacterium. There is a free for these service labs. It's no longer a free service. Uh, and you want to contact in advance to find out the best type of samples to um, send uh, because otherwise, as um, somebody else mentioned, they're just going to end up being disposed of because the samples aren't right. Uh, so call ahead for details. Uh, find out what the cost structure is. It does change on, on occasion. Um, and what to do if a tree has HLB? Well, we all know that there's no cure um, and you can't prune it out. So you're really talking about looking at good nutritional support once that happens. Um, Say that say a tree has declined to the point where you don't love it anymore and it's kind of an eyesore. What what, what should a grow what should a homeowner do? Well, removing removing the tree is definitely an option, particularly if it's unsightly. Um, but uh, once you do that, you really need to make sure that you are also getting rid of the tree stump um, because those stumps will sprout uh, sprout uh, shoots. Those shoots will then be will be attractive to psyllids and will be carrying the uh, bacterium, and uh, they will then be able to spread that to say a new plant if you wanted to plant a new citrus tree. So you would just be uh, infecting uh, your young tree from your old tree, and that would be counterproductive. Uh, I know that we've had a lot of talk about things like IPCs and such, so I'm not going to belabor that topic. Uh, we do have a protocol for handling. HLB and canker in master gardener clinics, um, sending, you know, preferably if you send a dis digital photo to a plant clinic, um, but you may, you know, depending on the quality of the phone of the uh, homeowner's ability to take photos, it may be necessary to ask the homeowner to bring a sample in, ask them to double bag it in a clear zip top bag and uh, bring it in. Um, if for whatever reason you're not able to positively diagnose that, um, then you would want to contact, consult uh, your local expert. Um, and then uh, if it's canker, you want to provide the UF IFAS literature for homeowners and our current management recommendations. And then also if it's HLB again, you'd want to advise the homeowner that the tree can decline um, but and become unproductive. But, uh, and so they're going to really need to step up their care and then provide them with the appropriate literature to help them do that. Um, just general reminders for homeowners particularly, but really for disease management everywhere. Uh, cultural measures are your first line of defense to protect trees for any disease. Pesticides are all, not always necessary or even effective. Um, tree appearance for some of these things may suffer, but it, the tree's not necessarily going to be damaged in a fundamental way. This is particularly for the fungal diseases. Obviously, HLB is a different story. Um, fruit blemishes are not necessarily affecting the internal fruit quality. And so I would encourage people to still eat those fruit. Um, they're just maybe not as beautiful as you might like them to be. Uh, and then as needed, horticultural oil and copper fungicides would be the homeowner's best choices for management. 
I, I would be happy to take any questions if we still have time. We do have a few minutes and there are a few um, questions. And Dr. Doody, thanks for that very thorough presentation. Um, really quick, um, rapid fire, does alt brown spot produce stunted tangerine fruits? Um, I suppose it could, but it probably your biggest problem would be that the tangerines might fall off the tree. Um, so some stunting could occur. Okay. Is sugar bell susceptible to alter maria, maria? Sugar bell is got a very, very, very low susceptibility. So it, it's not going to be your major problem with sugar bell. Um, Mindy asks, if composting at home or large scale high temperatures, what is the risk of fungal diseases retaining and impacting if using compost on edible landscape later? Hold on a second, let me look at that. Um, it was at 1124. Composting at home. Chat box. <clears throat> uh, most of the ones that I'm recommending that you compost really shouldn't be uh, affecting, um, I wouldn't necessarily put the compost right underneath my citrus tree, but uh, particularly if you're not certain that you've gotten rid of all of the leaf litter as much as possible, uh, you know, it's not completely composted, but in most of these diseases, the compost tends to get rid of them enough for, for uh, adequate management. Okay. Um, Barbara asked, what is recommended citrus height if we plan to demonstrate use of copper? Well, as high as you can get your spray nozzle, you know, it depends on what you're using to spray and how much pressure you've got to get up to the top of the tree. So obviously, if it's a 15 foot tree, that's going to be really challenging with a home sprayer. Uh, so I would recommend probably under eight feet or so. Okay, and then Cesar asks, in general terms, would copper solutions be the most accessible form of fungicides for backyards? Yes, it's probably pretty much close to the only ones that I would recommend. Um, there are a few that you could buy in various bottles from, you know, Home Depot, but not very many, many of them are, um, well, a lot of them, you know, you need to be able to use them well, uh, and a lot of them are going to be particularly effective. Okay, so I think that's most of the questions, um, other than prevention, what would be the best backyard fungicide to bring a plan back, plant back from a fungal disease? Excuse me. Probably copper. Could you repeat that again? Probably copper. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, I want to thank everyone for staying with us a little bit more, and I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Alvarez for our next one.